Amen. Last week, uh, we finished up chapter 1 of, of the book of Revelation. And uh, I know some of you guys are new. And if you want to go back and catch up on anything, if you go to our YouTube page, the uh, it's under the podcast, I believe. Is that right, Austin? Is it not under the podcast? Just under videos. And... Uh, but you just look at Revelation episode one, two, three. This will be number five here tonight. But one through four is all, is up, and you can kind of catch up and uh, pay no attention to the guy talking. It's I don't know if we're doing video. It may just be audio only, just with a logo, so you can turn it on while you're driving or or whatever. You're sitting. Maybe you can listen to it while you're trying to go to sleep. I know that works real well on Sunday mornings, and uh, I'm. <coughs> I'll catch that in a minute. I'll throw it like a grenade. <laughs> I love you too. All right. Well, we're going to start tonight, Revelation chapter number two and verse number seven. And while you're turning over there, I want to just give you a brief, just a brief overview. When I say brief, I mean like two minutes that you got to, to turn over there. And I'm going to try not to take any longer than that. Uh, we're not going to cover all the things that I'm about to say tonight. Uh, I wanted to, but we can't. We don't have enough time. Uh, most of y'all got to be in the bed. Uh, but we're going to talk about. I broke this 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 whole this whole first seven verses down into six, really six things. But I'm going to try to bump them, come on, combine one of them, and break it down into five teaching points, and uh, we'll cover them over the next few weeks. Uh, but what we're going to do tonight is the background. And I've about decided now I'm reworking my Bible, my study. Y'all seen that big notebook I had? And I'm redoing it because I didn't. I ended up not liking it. Uh, it's taking too much time, and I couldn't say things straight enough. So I'm redoing it, and I'm putting it all in outline form, and I'm going to do it this way. Background, the, the commendation... What, who he's talking to, what he's talking about. I'm going to try to get to those points. And then I'm going to talk about criticisms. And we're going to talk about things that people may say against it and for it. I'm going to give you other, I'm going to talk about things that are out there floating around that you might have never heard before. Uh, I think it's important. You know, uh, one of the things I learned in the military, if you're going to know, if you're going to really be successful in any, any battle, anything that you fight, you need to know how your enemy thinks and how they operate. You need to study film. You need to, to learn about them, learn their tendencies. So it's important that you hear other arguments uh, and other ideas so that you know how to, you know, so that you can put things into perspective, take the, the truth, and match it up against what you hear. Uh, the fourth thing is we're going to talk about counsel. And I just kind of covered that in that. And but the last thing I'm going to combine the two is the applications along with the promises. If you'll apply what the scripture says to your life, uh, you'll find that the, his promises are sure. And every time that you, uh, every time that you make application in your life, uh, it'll be another promise that you'll see fulfilled uh, out of the word. So uh, tonight what we're going to do, with, I'm just going to read the first seven verses of chapter number two. Most people are very familiar with these the, the the seven churches. Most people know about them. They've heard about them. You've heard people preach about them. If you grew up like I did in a fundamentalist environment, you heard people just pound away about them, and and you learn a lot of things. You learn more about what people were against than what the Lord was for. So I'm going to try to reverse a little bit of that. Uh, the Lord's pretty plain about what He's against. He don't need my help. But I want to try to explain to you, maybe bring out some things that God is for, uh, to help you understand. When we started this, what did I say the book of Revelation was about? Some of you have been here from the beginning. It's about Jesus. Do not focus on the tribulations. Do not focus on uh, the judgments. Don't focus on the plagues. Don't focus on the terror. All those things are there, and they're meant to be talked about. And we're going to talk about them. We're not going to shy away from any of those things. But the book, the reason it was written was to bring glory to Christ. It's all about Jesus. If it ain't about Jesus, then it ain't even worth reading. So 
it, I'm, I'm really want you to understand that this, the whole book of Revelation is about Christ. And it's about who he is and who he is to us, for us, what he wants to do with us, through us. And I, I'm very thankful for, for what he's been showing me in this. And I'm going to tell you, when this started, I didn't imagine it going this way. It may change again. Who knows? I mean, I, I, I switch up like, never mind, I ain't saying it. But anyway, I'm kind of like a, like a, a passing wind, you know. Here today, gone tomorrow, like a vapor. Ain't that what they say? Y'all be quiet over there. You're killing me out there. All right, let's read together. Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 1. We'll read down through verse number 7. And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and has, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from henceforth where thou art fallen, and repent and do the first work, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We're going to stop right there just tonight, and we're going to focus on the letter to the church of Ephesus. All right? Interpretation. If you have something in your mind, I want to give you some words to be thinking about to stir your brain. and want you to think a little bit about what I'm saying and why I'm saying what I'm saying. It's all about interpretation. Many times... In our lives, we make decisions based on how we interpret information, okay? Most bad decisions are made because you had bad information. If you really think about it, somebody ever pop, 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 pop in your ear and somebody else was quiet and they influenced you and you made a decision that negatively affected somebody else, ended up negative, negatively affecting you because you find out later on when everything circles around, the information that you got wasn't so good. It's all about how you interpret the information. You got to be, you got to look past what you're hearing and you got to look at the whole picture of what's going on. So when you're interpreting things, even when you're interpreting a conversation or, and it applies in everyday life to people, when people are talking, you got to look past the words that are coming out of their mouth and you got to see everything. What's the old saying about actions? They speak louder than words. Pictures are worth a thousand words. You know, you got to, you can't just go by what you see and you can hardly ever go by what you hear. As the old, I heard somebody say one time, don't believe anything you say or you hear and how only half of what you see. And that's, I found that out to be about half true. So interpretation is important when you talk, when you look at Ephesus because there's some things and I'm going to, I'm going to dip a little bit into the other churches just to hire a smidgen as I get along. Uh, because there's a few other words uh, that we're going to hit on. But these these churches, all of the churches, of the seven churches, were near the Isle of Patmos. You all know where Patmos was. That's where John was in exile at. He was there by himself. He was in prison. He was not alone, but he was lonely. And that's something that the Lord kind of dealt with me about this week. John the Revelator, he's on this island. He's surrounded by probably thousands of people, but he's lonely. Even though he's a criminal, he's locked up for doing something for the Lord, and he, but he's there, but he's still labeled a criminal. And all these other criminals who probably deserve to be there, they didn't want to have nothing to do with him either. So it is possible to be in a room full of people and still feel as lonely as the day is long. Uh, so, you know, how you interpret your situation sometimes is one of those things. John was one of those guys, though, who was fortunate enough, 
He didn't really ever feel lonely. And we talked about that a little bit last week. Uh, if you read through his, the gospel that he penned down, how does he refer to himself? He never calls himself by his name. He always referred to himself as that disciple who Jesus loved. So it was more about him wanting to stay close to the heart of Jesus. He, you see him, his word pictures in there and all these paintings, you know, verbally, him having his head laid on the breast of Christ, you know, listening. He was just trying to, who knows what he was doing, but in my mind, he wanted to hear his heartbeat. He wanted to, he wanted to hear his voice when his, when his lungs, you know, started to fill with oxygen and he started to speak. He wanted to hear everything. Uh, he, he was just that kind of guy. So I don't know that, that, that John the Revelator was ever, that he ever felt alone. We don't ever read it. We never, we can, I never pick up on it in his writings that he ever felt like he was by himself. He always felt like he had a friend in Christ and that Christ was always there with him. So he never felt like he was alone in his troubles. But all these churches were around and John writes all of these letters to the churches. And there, uh, even in what we read uh, in verse number seven, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church is. Something that stuck out to me this past week that i never seen before. Didn't see it when I put, started putting this together, but I saw it this week. These letters were meant, even though they were right, he, even though he named a certain church each and every time, these, these letters would be passed around to all of the churches. Every church would read what was going on at the other church. So what one was good at and what one was bad at, everybody else would know it too. But everybody else was going to know what they were good and bad at. John was going to spill the beans on the whole lot of them. So here we are now seeing that the, these, these letters to these churches, even though they were written specifically, they were meant to be passed around because even though somebody in Thyatira or somebody in Ephesus or somebody in, in, in Pergamos, you know, was somewhere else, they may be struggling with the same things the Laodiceans were struggling with, and they may be in one of those other places. So they, everybody is different, and everything, and that needed to be passed around because it was applicable to everybody, not just one particular church. Even though as a group, corporately, they were doing things pretty well, he said, I have somewhat of an odd against you, right? So there was at least one thing that they were doing kind of wrong, and that was that they had left their first love. These churches literally existed. It was normal for them to talk to one another. They ran trade routes. They did things uh, that would just blow you away. We still do the same stuff today. We just do it with a whole lot of technology and a whole lot of speed and big fancy equipment and airplanes and trains and automobiles. They didn't have that stuff. But their, their trade routes and their, their methods of doing business, it, it amazes me how we still do things similarly to the way they did them. These letters were literally to specific churches, as I said, but they, all of their problems, their issues, even though they were present in that day in that time period, they're also they're also still existing today. They existed in every single one of those churches, and they still exist today. Those troubles are still there. We still go through the same thing. All of these issues that we see all through the Bible, they dealt with them in 70, uh, 70 A.D. We're still dealing with them today. It's twenty twenty four. We're still facing the same kind of stuff, the same kind of problems. So. The Bible will always be relevant as long as we're here drawing breath. We're going to always need the word. They were written to specific churches, specific people. They were all written in the, basically at the same time. Obviously, they were written one right after the other, uh, but they were all written basically in the, same, in the same stretch of time. So John penned them all down, sends them all out, because obviously he's writing them down as he's getting them in this in this uh, word from the Lord. Specific churches, specific people, specific times, specific lessons, specific principles, all of these things, just like the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Colossians, all the other New Testament epistles, all of Paul's writings, John's writings, Peter's writings, Jude, every, everybody that ever wrote anything down, 
They all had the same problems, every single one of them. Because our problems are timeless. Our problems are universal. You know why that is? Because at the heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. We make our own problems. I do it, you do it, we all do it. We, we cause more trouble for ourselves than we ever relieve ourselves of most of the time. Uh, I don't know about y'all. My mouth will get me in trouble. I mean, it will get me in trouble. Quick. Uh, not because I mean for it to. Sometimes it just happens that way. You know, it just, you know, there's no saying it just be like that sometimes. You know, people, people can't, people can't help but come after me for whatever reason. Uh, maybe it's my job. Maybe it's my look. Maybe they don't like the way I look. I'm, I'm good with that. I get up in the morning sometimes want to be a smart aleck to my own self in the mirror. You know, it just, it's just, it just be like that sometimes. We wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Somebody, somebody does something to our Cheerios. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We go through, we all have these problems, right? We don't all wake up holy and heavenly and, and re, you know, we don't wake up with our hands raised and we don't wake up in tune with God. We should, but we don't. My problem for me is, and I know what my problem is, and I, I mean, I'm just willing to say it where some of the rest of y'all ain't. I'll tell you straight away. My problem is I get up and before I get a hold of the Lord, I'm thinking about what's coming at me. I'm already thinking about what's, what I'm going to have to do when I get to work. I'm thinking about them 42 phone calls that's going to be on my voicemail. Everybody's mad because their garbage ain't picked up on time. You know, they're, they're mad because their recycling bag got left. They're mad because a piece of cardboard fell out of the truck. They're mad because I ain't come scooped up the dead skunk off the side of the road. I mean, I take them all day long. And I'm thinking about that stuff. And you'd think after all this time that I'd know the first thing I need to do when I wake up is go find me a corner and get on my face. But this happens every time. My alarm will go off, and I don't heed it on the first buzzer, and my wife will scream at me. And then I'm in a bad mood. And I ain't got the courage to say nothing about it. So I get on up and I pout for the first 25 minutes. <laughs> then I'm awake. Oh. You know? It would be my fault anyway, right? That's how it go. Honestly, guys, I, I, I say stuff to be funny because it's really relevant. If you think about some of the simple things. Now, you think about sometimes in your life how something seems funny and it started out kind of, kind of pointless, but it ballooned into something bigger because we don't get control of it. That's, that's what my mouth and my mind in collaboration with my mouth will get me. If I don't get up and get a hold of God early and often, my day goes bad. And, if, and it takes me sometimes on up into the mid-morning to, to ever get a grip on what's going on. Sometimes it's the evening. Sometimes I just lose it, and I just throw the white flags up, and I just, the whole day, and I'm running the whole day. Can't think, can't concentrate, don't, nothing goes right. You know, and, and on my way home, I'm thinking to myself, I better fix this before I get to the house. I must make you if you don't. Uh, Y'all forgive me. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not really. But anyway, I'll tell you a funny story. One day I had mouthed off just a little too much. And I had, I knew I had made my wife upset at me, right? I had gone all day long thinking about what was going to happen to me when I got home. I was prepared for war. I really was. I knew it was going to be bad. So I opened up the door, and I eased the door open, and I pitched my cap into the living room. And I waited. And, and it didn't fly back out at me. So I poked my head in, and I seen her sitting over here, and she's staring at me. And then she smiled, and I knew everything was going to be okay. She said, what are you doing? And I said, I was just seeing whether or not it was safe to come in. <laughs> she said, well, that depends on how you're going to act when you get in here. 
ain't that exactly the way that, that the Lord, I mean, we, we act like we're on the couch and the Lord ought to pitch his hat inside to make sure it's all right to come in and do business. When really it ought to be the other way around. You know, we 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 like to lay, we love to read, and we love to talk about how bad other things are. If you don't believe that we like to do that, read Facebook, watch the news. I mean, get on the internet. We love to read the negative. We're so consumed all the time with the negative. We hear these things about about Ephesus, and and we miss all this time. We miss about these things that he says in the first part of chapter two. Look what he says. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou cannot bear them which are evil and how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and you've found them liars and you've, and you've born. And that word born uh, in the original language uh, simply means, let me get down here, where it means persevered. And you have uh, not, and you, and you have patience and you've not become weary. You've labored and you've not fainted, which means you have not become weary. For my name's sake. All of these things, we, we skip over that because we get to verse number four and that's all we can think about. We want to hear more about what the Lord's got against you. And instead of what the Lord has, all these things that you're doing right. And let me tell you something. I know we all got places we can check, we can check up and do better, me included. And I'm honest with you about a lot of those things. I mean, I'm just out in the open. And most of us are. And let's be, and then let's get a little deeper than that. There are things going on in some of our lives that we we know good and well when they're happening. We need to fix them. We we know we need to check up right then, pump the brakes, and let's fix this. But if we're not careful, we'll whoop each other into this delusion that we can't do anything right. Something the Lord showed me this week is stop talking about. Not stop talking about it all together, but stop putting so much emphasis on what people are doing wrong and start figuring out ways to encourage them and the things that they're doing correctly. You know, there's a lot of things that people are doing right. And they got an area too. And let me tell you, would you want somebody to cast you out because you did 99 things right and one thing wrong? And that's not the way it needs to be handled. Yes, we need to check up. Yes, we need to do things better. Yes, all of us can clean some things up. But, but when, we're, when somebody's trying and you're making a great effort, don't, don't beat them down. Nobody needs a three-pound Bible whooping them on top of the head when they're trying their best to do better. Most of us are learning. We're learning it together. I don't know how it was for y'all or is for y'all. I know how it was for me. I got thrown in. I, I, got, I got tossed in there and I just had to figure it out. Thank God I had a few people around that helped me learn and helped me grow. Had people I could pick their brain, and I did. I learned a lot. But then, you know, five, six years into it, I started taking some initiative. I started going to church meetings. I, I enrolled in classes. I did anything and everything that I could do to try to help myself grow and learn and become more knowledgeable in the Scriptures because I wanted to be smarter than I was. So when I think about interpretation... You gotta, you, I want you to understand that it's more than just what you see. You've got to put more thought into what you read. And I'm saying that to you now. It's important. I'm saying it to you now. Because as we go through this and get farther and farther in, when I, when, I, when I talk about interpretation, you need to understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. And I'm giving that all to you tonight. I'm setting it up, and I'm, and I'm never going to revisit that again, hopefully. Second thing, prophetical, historical, or both. All of these different scholars, they've, they've seen these things, and some say they're prophetical, some say they're just historical, some say they're both. I'm going to prescribe, I'm going to fall on the side of both. I think they're historical, I think they're relevant for the day, and I think they're relevant for the future. I'll give you a few reasons. One, because there's seven letters. Four, you know, there's four series of sevens, actually, in this, so... And the number seven represents completion or completeness or something that's whole or fulfilled. And I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, it could indicate that they're symbolic and it might mean nothing at all. But I, I just, I'm just going to hold to the fact that I do believe that they're symbolic. It's too much that's, that applies 
and that has that has applied since the time it was written. It still applies. It still applies. It still applies. I'm going to throw a, a theory at you in a minute, and something that the Lord kind of showed me today. I thought it was cool, and I'm going to share it with you. You don't have to believe it. The last thing I want you to be is some cult follower and just follow me because I say it. Read the Bible for yourself, and 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 I'll help you the best I can. I'm not going to tell you anything, though, that the Bible don't say, and I sure ain't going to say the Bible says it if the Bible don't say it. But it's something to think about. Secondly, seven churches were not all, or these seven churches were, were not the most famous. They were not at all influential uh, in the areas that they lived in. In, or in that region. For example, Thyatira was smaller. Thyatira was a lesser known of the churches because it didn't have as many people. Obviously, it was the, I, 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 in my mind, I'm thinking of it as it was kind of like rural Jackson County, right? It's like uh, Mud Creek or, or Wooville. You know, you look, when you say Wooville, you got to leave the D out, right? If you're from the Wooville area, you, you leave the D out of Wooville. Uh, Skyline, Letcher, Bass, Carn, Rash, uh, Big Coon, Little Coon, Shake Rag. You know, you got all these little communities, right? And yeah, Fabius and uh, Hog Jaw Valley. And, I mean, there's all kinds of places, right? So there's, you know, you, you, the Wanville, Fackler, Martintown, Lick Skillet. I mean, we got all these little places. When you, when you, and I say these names at you because you think about them. A lot of, some of y'all are saying names y'all ain't heard of. Some of y'all ain't never heard of. Because we've turned them in now to Hollywood and Stevenson, Scottsboro, Skyline, Pisgah, Section, you know. And, they, and they're encompassed in the bigger areas. Uh, you know, so, but when, when John's writing these letters to the churches, this, when he, when he's talking about things like, or churches like Thyatira, he's saying something that I think is oftentimes looked over, and that was simply this. God may have chosen these churches specifically because they symbolize something more about what the church was going to be like moving forward than what it was in the current, in the present. And that's the reason I subscribe to that it's probably fit for both. He, he wrote these letters directly to those churches, but he wrote those letters with a greater purpose in mind because he knew that, that word, those words, those letters would circulate. Everybody would get it, and they would just, from there. People were going to copy them down. Those people were hungry. They, they couldn't go to Walmart and buy a Bible. If they, if they got a copy of something, they, they tried to scribble it down, or they got somebody who could write to come and write it down. They would pay to have somebody take a piece of paper and copy as much word for word of the scriptures down so they could have, you know, there, there are recorded incidents in history where people, people would only have like one chapter of the Bible that they could actually read. It was available for them to look at their whole lives. And it was written on one old piece of paper and the ends would be, you know, all, all to eat off of it stuff where so many people would handle it and they would hold it against their chest and just cry it's tear stain and some of the words would even be because it was just felt people were so uh, so passionate about just having a little peace you know we got it so good we don't understand the third reason I think is because there's a clear progression if you follow these this pattern there's a clear progression of the way it goes and right here, I want to hit just a little bit of that. And I wrote down some notes. I'm not, I couldn't memorize them because they came too late in the game. And I'm not good at memorizing things in a hurry anymore. I have to have time. Uh, but I wrote it down, and I hope, and like I said, it'll be, on, it'll be videoed so, or at least recorded. You can go back and listen. Ephesus is the first church that's addressed. In this letter, the only one of the seven that mentions people claiming to be apostles. They they could they could weed out a fake. They were good at it, and I mean, and so the Lord's giving them props, right? Which was a problem in a lot of the New Testament period. If you go into Paul's writing, Paul talks about it too. First Thessalonians three and four, he talks about it specifically about people who had crept into the church. First Thessalonians, as a matter of fact, was probably the first of Paul's epistles to the, the church at Thessalonica. And the reason that he wrote it 
And when I was in Bible college, they, they, they put it, bumped it into our heads that the reason that Paul wrote it was to combat false prophets and false teachers. Because there were people who were claiming to know the truth and were spreading untruth. Uh, so th that was part of the reason he wrote it, and he turned right around and wrote uh, Second Thessalonians. So Eph Ephesus is the first church that's mentioned. It was especially fitting for the age that they were living in, but it's also fitting for the age that we're living in because the things that were going, that he was talking about, people leaving their first love, that being the only negative, it's kind of like where we're at now. And I'm not saying, listen, the last thing I'm going to do, uh, I have my own personal feelings about church attendance, right? Like, I'm here, you guys ought to be here. That's kind of the way I think. But I also know that youngs ain't me. And what's important to me ain't necessarily important to everybody else. And just because I think a certain way about it don't mean everybody else thinks a certain way about it. And I be forgetting that sometimes. And, my, and just so y'all know that y'all have an advocate, my wife is quick to remind me that everybody ain't me. And everybody don't think like me. Thank God I have that in my life. Let me just tell you something. I know y'all think I make fun of her a little bit, but I'm going to tell you, without her, you ends up being trouble. She is the voice of reason most of the time. Keeps me from spouting off things that just pop into my head. and You know, I, I, I try to vet everything through her first, and she tells me whether or not I can say it. <laughs> On Sunday morning, she tells me whether or not I can wear it. You know, without her, I, I, don't, I don't know how I'd get along in the world. I hope I die first. That's all I can say. I know she's going to Hawaii with my insurance money, but still. Ain't that kind of what that, that God did, that Jesus did with John the Revelator here? He's, he mentioned something that they needed to fix, but it was something that was not just fitting. He knew that that problem was going to be rolling way down the line. He knew that when he got to the end of the church age, that they was going to have the same problem. He knew when we got here to 2024, we'd still be battling, falling out of love with the Lord. We watch soap operas. We watch movies. We like watching them Hallmark movies, right? When nobody asks you, Brother Mark. <laughs> I love you. I'm just kidding. Please don't, be, please don't eat me. Huh? <clears throat> But we watched those movies, and me and Don was laughing the other night because it was so funny. I was like, Lifetime, hooray, you know, and I'm sitting over there, and I'm, and I'm watching the movie, and I'm like, man, I have seen this movie a hundred times, but I ain't ever seen it. And Don starts telling me what's going to happen, and I'm like, you've done seen the movie. No, I ain't seen the movie. And you know it happened nearly verbatim, just like she said it would. I got to thinking about it. That's every Lifetime movie, every Hallmark movie. Even happens in the regular movie. Boy meets girl, or girl meets boy. They fall in love. They heat it off. They get to liking one another. They express their feelings. And then this and makes that and mad. And then they get over it. And then that and makes this and mad. And then they get over it. And then they come back together. And they kiss at the end. And everybody lives happily ever after. That's always how it goes. But you always know that that's how the movie's going to go. Reckon why they write them movies that way. And we know how they go in because we keep watching them. I don't know if we think they're going to turn out different. I mean, we know what's going to happen, right? But we still watch the stupid thing. And over and over and over again, we read the Bible over and over and over again. The Lord's already told us what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and, and all but when it's going to happen. We don't know the time, but we know it's going to happen. And we still can't get it through our minds that Satan has no power over us. And he has no victory over us. And he cannot rule our lives. The Lord sits on the throne of our heart, not him. And he, has, he has, should have no power, no control, and no authority in our lives. But still, we read the book. We read all the way to the back of the book. Jesus wins, and we still act like he don't. I don't understand. But I do it. Just like the rest of you do, I do it. Ephesus, the first church. Smyrna was the second church. After the apostolic age, the church entered a time of persecution, which is reflected in the second letter. Pergamon, when he starts with it, they'd started to display 
some what they call syncretic leanings. Thyatira, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pause right there just a minute, but I'm going to, I got to get through Thyatira first, and I'm gonna circle back. The longest letter was to Thyatira, and it could symbolize that it was the longest age of the church, which was what's what what would but came to be known the Middle Ages, right? You all know what the Middle Ages are? I ain't got time to give you a history lesson. But Brother Mark will after church because he knows all about that stuff. But the Middle Ages. But the Thyatirans also struggled with syncretism. And it was so common in the Middle Ages that Jesus said that the victor would rule over the nations. And we see the church in that time period in the Middle Ages. The church became the victor because it ruled over basically much of the world. And you say, how do you know they did that? They had all the political influence. I love to watch movies about, you know, uh, England and I, I, the medieval times. I love Vikings. I love, you know, those history channel shows that talk about uh, the Knights Templar and things like that. I love history. I, I love to, to watch those things. One of the things I learned about the church, especially in as, as Christianity made its way across you know, all Europe and, and even and on into America, especially when they got to America, the church had all the political power. And I'm, I'm not somebody today who would stand up and tell you that, that it would be good if the church was in total control and they weren't people who didn't believe like us because I'm telling you, we've had that before in America and it was not a very bright period in, in our history. The the church, especially religious leaders, have been known to do some pretty rough stuff. They're still doing it today. Matter of fact, it happens all the time. I mean, some pretty rough stuff. You go back to the beginnings of America, I mean, all you had to do was just say a woman was a witch. They'd, they'd tie them up and burn them. No proof, no real evidence. Oh, this. You go up in Salem. I mean, some of that stuff is gruesome. And I'm not saying that some of them wouldn't. I'm just saying you know, I talk on the phone to 15 or 20 of them every day. I know they're still alive. I'm just kidding, y'all. Somebody hear that, I'll get fired just short of the world. Hope y'all better get ready to pay me. That's all. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, syncretism. Does anybody know what syncretism means? Together. Should have known the teacher would answer that. I forgot she was sitting in here. There was a time period... And we're circling back into that time period right now. We're hitting it again. Where people were trying to make all the religions not necessarily the same, but they were trying to figure out a way to make them all work together. It happened, it's very prominent in the Christian church, and we don't even realize it. Most, most people don't even know when it happened, and I'm not trying to give you a history lesson, but it happened after... Uh, which one of them was the sun worshiper, Mark? The Roman emperor that was the sun worshiper. What was his name? He's, he's the one that, in, that instituted Sunday worship. I can't remember his name either. I mean, I had it right here. I was thinking about it. I was looking at it before I came here tonight and then forgot it. That's how bad my memory is getting. Should have wrote it down. Anyways, the Roman emperor of that day he, he was one of the first ones to institute it. He started trying to get away for the Jews to get along, Christians to get along, for the, all of the pagans to get along. They were dealing with a lot of people, influx from other places, people moving in. So the Romans were multicultural, just like America is today. They had a whole lot of different beliefs floating around. Constantine, that was him. Somebody looked it up on the Google, didn't it? Elizabeth. Elizabeth was laughing. I just figured she did it. Constantine. All right, so he was so he was the one that did it. And uh, over time, what is the church now? We defend that and we say, well, it was that was the Lord's day. That was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. That's the reason we do that. That became our kind of the the reason that they that they got away from doing that, which is which is fine. Listen to me on this right here. Let me just deal with this once and for all. I don't care what day we show up to worship the Lord. I don't care if it's Friday or Tuesday, Sunday, Saturday. I don't care. My job as a Christian is to technically worship the Lord every single day. 
I'm supposed to carry myself, conduct myself every single day like I'm going to church. If I'm going to do it on Monday, I might as well do it on Sunday. It's just kind of the way it is. So the, to, deal with, to deal with what they were dealing with in Pergamum and Thyatira, is they had, a, they had that to overcome because they were two, two churches in particular who were trying to just get everybody together and just let everybody get along. And everybody, you can come into church and you can kind of do your own thing, but what happened is they got undone by that because as you get different ideas in, different fundamental beliefs, then you, before long, you've got seven, eight different little churches inside one, and it ain't never going, it ain't never last. Everybody's got to be pulling the wagon in the same direction. You can't be pulling it apart. You've got to be pulling it together in unison. Let me move on. Sardis, by the time the church of Sardis comes out in history, the, the, what we call the time period of the Reformation was, was on, and it was in the Church of Sardis is much like the church in the Reformation age. Philadelphia is described in a positive light, probably could represent the golden age of the church in my opinion, you know, which is basically that time period after the Reformation. Really, we're kind of at the end, and some people would say we're in the Laodicean part of it, but I think we're kind of at the end of the Philadelphian part. We're at the end of the golden age of the church. You know, where it's, it's still kind of easy right now to worship the Lord. You can come to church for the most part and don't have to worry about getting shot up. Don't have to worry about getting beat up. You don't have to worry about, you know, all kind of meanness and, and evil, you know, coming upon you while you're here. So we're kind of in that. I think we're in the, in the back part of the, church, the Philadelphian age. The Laodicean age, though, is the one where we're going to get, where we're already seeing it. We're seeing it. It's crept in. So we're, we're already in that. And the Laodiceans is, a, is a, an area, just to give you a little a background about it, is where materialism and self-sufficiency and that whole, that whole culture is then seeped in. Their love of money, their love of entertainment, their love of having widespread issues. They were okay with having... All, um, they were okay with having beef with, with a whole bunch of people at the same time. and It just wasn't no good. It was not a good time period. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I'm telling you, if I take, if I take the way that, that Revelation, that each book, that each letter to the churches is written, and I, and I break it down just the way I'm doing, and I think about it historically, if I think about it you know, when I, uh, prophetically, but when I think about what, what the Lord is trying to say to John, to us, in particular, we can learn something that we're still dealing with out of every single letter, every single age and time period. Even though Ephesus was the first and Smyrna was the second, Pergamum was the third, Thyatira was the fourth, even though we're past those ages, those time periods, chronologically, we can still gain something from what they went through because some of that stuff still happens. And it may not be hitting everybody, but it's hitting some people. And what happened with the second one may not hit the first, and it may not hit the third, but it might hit five and seven. You know what I mean? So it's, it's bouncing in and out. So it's important to make sure that you look and see what's going on all over the place. When you think about the way that it's written and you think about applying it historically and prophetically, which is the way I believe that it should be applied. I'm not going to beat you over the head about it. That's just the way I feel about it. But I think it makes more sense to me as I read through the text and read through these letters, and I believe it will make more sense to you if you think through what, what he's saying and think past what he's saying right in front of his face and think 2,000 years down the road. If you think 1,000 years down the road, if you know anything about history, any time period at all, if you read through these letters to these churches, when you start to read through them, you'll start to see things that happened immediately, 100 years later, 500 years later, 1,000 years later, 2,000 years later, still the same stuff. Not maybe as widespread in one area as it is another, but still the same stuff. If this interpretation is correct, and I believe it is, then we're, we're already moving into the last, to the last part of the church age, which is, which is exciting, but it ought to scare us to death, right? 
So we got structure, and then you got the angel to the church of Ephesus. When he mentions this in Revelation, he talks about him in Revelation 1. The word for angel means messenger. In the Greek, it's a reference to the leader of the church of Ephesus who would receive this letter and then pass it on to the church. And then this letter that Jesus gave John were the exact words. It's a letter directly from him to the church. It's, a, it's, it's to be looked at and thought about like it's some kind of priceless treasure. And you say, what do you mean a treasure? Well, it's a treasure because you have a record of something that the Lord himself said to somebody else. I have a little envelope at my house uh, that my mother, right before she passed away, she scribbled down on a little piece of paper. And it's the only thing that I really have next to a cookbook that's got her handwriting on it. And it says, uh, pretty simple, it says, I, I, I love you so much. I'm so proud of you and all that you have accomplished and will accomplish. Uh, I just want you to know I'm proud of you and, I, and continue to be day by day. And I cherish that thing. I mean, you can break in and get everything I got. You try to get my mama's letter, and I may break your neck. I may pull your head from your shoulders, or at least try to, because that thing is more valuable to me, valuable to me than all of my stuff. That's exactly the way we ought to think about, and that's the way they thought about this letter. And that's the way we ought to think about the word. That's how serious it ought to be to us. When Jesus is telling John this stuff, I got this thought today, and I thought, and I wrote it down. It says, if Jesus wrote a letter to Mud Creek, what would he say? If, if he wrote a letter to each and every person in this room, and I had to stand up here and read it, what would he say to you? I don't even want to know <laughs> what he would say to me. And I sure don't know. Well, never mind, I'm going to be quiet. She knows who I'm talking about. This description, the, the, the next to the last thing is this, the description of Christ. In the seven letters, in each of the seven letters beginning with the same, basically the same thing. You might expect that they, these things to be taken in chronological order, but really they're not. However, it does insp in, in, imply that a specific quality of Christ himself was shared with each specific church that he spoke to. Everything that he, every church that he talked to, every letter that he wrote, he included a little bit of himself in it, and we'll see that in all the other letters. He'll include a little bit. Uh, you might tell somebody who's grieving, uh, what do you say? Just, just trust the Lord. You know, I remember, and I, I hate to bring it up, but, but you're sitting there, and it's pretty. I remember the day that R.J. passed away, it was four years ago. Uh, I got off work that day. And it was something in my heart. Was just, it was just beating out of my chest. I had no idea how bad it was. And I left work, and I, I drove home, and I told my wife, I said, I need to go to Birmingham. And I, and I, and I, y'all didn't even know I was coming. And I, I just got in the truck, car, and I drove as fast as I could. And I got there literally 15, 20 minutes before, before he left. But you remember a couple of days I was down there before that. And most of y'all know because I've shared it with you. And I'm not, I don't need no pity. Y'all don't pity me, please. Because the Lord had reasons for doing everything. Starting in 09, on December the 31st of 2009, to August the 1st of 2020, I lost 22 family members. I mean, it's down now to me, my grandma, my uncle. I mean, there's just a few of us left. I did the funerals of all but one of them. And here's what I've learned about when I went through all that stuff. Every single one of them hurt real bad. They all hurt differently. Some of them hurt worse than others. But it was the first two that got my attention. Because... It was one was my great grandmother. She was the first. She was uh, until I got saved. She was the only saved person in my whole family. She was the only one up the line. All right, and then the and then a year to the day later, a year to the day later, I stood in the same chapel and preached 
the funeral of the youngest member of my family, which was my first grandchild, one day old. Now, the reason that I was able to tell Craig them things because I'd, I'd, I'd walked sort of that path. And if you, if you remember what I told you sitting down there in the little waiting area there looking over the city, words ain't going to do no good. Me telling you I'm sorry ain't going to fix it. That don't even help you. Me telling you that God knows don't make you feel no better. Me telling you that to leave it with the Lord, all that's going to do is make you mad. So this is what I learned because I had to experience it myself. And I went through it. And then I went through it when I lost my other grandmother. And I lost my mother. And then, you know, two of my best friends, two, two of my mentors, grandpas, uncles, aunts, just boom, 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 boom. Every, I had to come to terms with the fact that even that there was collateral beauty in everything. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to tell John the Revelator. Yes, there's bad stuff out here, but there's collateral beauty to be seen too. All except for him in a few places, right? Every one of these, and I mentioned the word structure a while ago, every one of the seven letters had a basic structure. Every one of them addressed the angel of the church. Every one of them addressed the description of Jesus. Every one of them had an I know statement. Every one of them had a commendation to the church. Every one of them had a criticism to the church. Every one of them had a counsel to the church. And every, one, every single letter had a promise to those who would overcome. Every single one of them had those same things in common. With the exceptions of two. Philadelphia and Smyrna got zero criticism. Zero. But the Laodiceans got zero praise. There was a time, especially in the Philadelphia, and that's why I consider it really the, the golden age of the church. There is, it, we're coming out of that time where you can see now there's a place to be criticized again. And maybe there was a time period where it shouldn't have, where it wasn't, and it probably should have been. But now we're moving back into reality. And there's a place, there's a place for us to be checking up, which is why I think we're moving to that Laodicean area, uh, our era of our existence. But here Jesus is holding the seven stars in his right hand. He's walking among the seven golden lampstands, which means he's still walking among the churches, and he's still holding us up. He's still holding his men up. He's still holding the word up. He's still holding the truth up. Jesus is not only upholding them, he's supporting them, but Jesus also knows. He knows their works. He knows the good that they do. But he's also aware of where they've fallen short. It's the same thing for us. He knows our hearts. He knows our minds. And whether we say it or whether we do it, he already knows. We can hide it from everybody else. We ain't hiding it from him. We already know those things. So I'm going to end tonight by asking the same question that I asked just a minute ago. And then I'm going to leave it with you. We'll pray and we'll be dismissed. If Jesus wrote a letter to Mud Creek and somebody had to stand up here and read it, what would he write to you? You don't got to answer that. But is that all he would write to you? Don't, even, don't say that other stuff. All right.